as I said, I think we're gonna have a great evening with a bumper crop of, of people joining. Uh, we're just standing by for a couple of minutes as more people um, uh, join. So just hang on for a moment. And in a couple of minutes, I'll start the proceedings. Um, and so I hope that people can see the slide uh, about the speaker that we have this evening. Buddy. Well, uh, thank you, everybody, for joining. Um, I'm going to start the proceedings in about a minute, and I'm really excited because there's a lot of very exciting people here, people that I know and haven't, some of you I haven't seen in a while. So thank you for joining. Just give us a moment, and we're going to get a couple more people online, and then we'll start. Hi, David. <laughs> yeah, so uh, thank you for joining everybody. Uh, I think we're gonna have a lot of excitement this evening, a lot of very interesting people in the, in the audience. Um, we're going to have Greg Vanderheiden speak at our monthly uh, program committee uh, meeting that we have tonight. And he's gonna talk about the past, present, and future of accessible computing. Uh, for those of you that don't know, that's all about disabilities, which many of us have um, and he's uh, been involved with this for decades uh, as the director of the Trace Center in University of Maryland, College Park. He's continuing his work that he uh, is well known for um, doing at uh, the Trace Center in Wisconsin. Um, and he's doing many other things that we'll hear about this evening, including trying to convene um, people through an NSF uh, project to, to really think about the future of disabilities. So um, as, we, as we get started um, for our program uh, for Beikai, uh, we typically start by telling you a little bit about Beikai. Um, it's the local chapter of um, the special interest group from Association for Computer Machinery on uh, Computer Human Interface. And, uh, you know, ACM is a great big organization and uh, CHI is a very important part of uh, their portfolio. And certainly it's the premier conference. Um, we have had um, great talks since 1989. We have really only missed two speakers, uh, two, two months of, uh, of talks in all of that time. One was 9-11 uh, um, and the other was um, um, due to the beginning of the COVID uh, season, uh, which we are slowly uh, coming out of. Um, to be part of us, we'd love it if you can join for $20 annually um, and you get all sorts of good stuff. Uh, we've gone on um, two different um, um, field trips this year, one to, uh, to play with um, surgery remotely, the other to watch um, people thinking about how to control all the airplanes in the Pacific uh, and in California. Fascinating um, uh, you know, facility over in Fremont where they where they um, died all the airplanes. And we were planning to have more of those. Uh, this month we were hoping to go visit a drone company that didn't quite work out. Uh, but we will. We are open to field trips and uh, talks at sites now. And we are hoping that um, in October, we're going to be having a, uh, if we're lucky, this, this talk about uh, remembering Richard Anderson, a person that has worked uh, tirelessly for, for Bay Kai for decades. Um, we'll, we'll be in a, in a physical location. Uh, we even have a nice one in mind. Um, and other things on our schedule are we have 
uh, on the fourth Thursday of the month is a great time if you're thinking about your career in user experience uh, to come to a 7 p.m. meeting, usually hosted by uh, our um, Vice Chair uh, Edward Lee. Um, and um, we uh, also, of course, the second Tuesday of the month, as you know, is our program committee. But the first Thursday of the month is a great time to get to know other people in Beikai and think about what you can do to help Beikai. We have lots of things you can do. You can do little things, you can do big things. We want people to get involved and we're happy to share share the uh, the fun of, of, of building um, these speaker series and, and getting all of the things on videotape and all of the good stuff that we do. So contact a volunteer at Beikai or chair at Beikai.org or vice chair at Beikai.org, any of those things work. But the main reason that we're here is to celebrate Greg Vanderheiden, yay! And I'm looking forward to a great talk by Greg Vanderheiden, uh, starting as soon as I uh, stop sharing my my uh, my slides, so that you can take over. Uh, Gre uh, thank you very much. <clears throat> Hi, uh, thank you very much. Um, the uh, history of uh, computer access. Um, uh, actually began before computer access, uh, before we had uh, actually any type of personal computers and stuff. Um, earliest work uh, were communication systems. They were uh, developed, a lot of them in, in Europe. Uh, they used stepper, stepper relays, for those of you who had no enough telecom to know how the phone system used to run. Uh, then they got up to actually using core memory at one time so they could have uh, a little bit of uh, ability to type out um, solenoids pulling down keys on, on typewriters and things like this. Um, I came onto the scene in about 1971, so 52 years ago. And um, uh, at the time, well, actually, I got stalled because I was tricked into going out to a school to see a young lad who couldn't speak or write or type and was using a piece of wood with the letters uh, wood burned into it. And he would point out the letters, oh, I think about one letter every two or three seconds. So it was slow, but um, but he was a smart aleck. And and so it was really slow, but but I just was taken by the um, the character. This was actually the, this is a different time. So I was a senior in college and this was the first person with a disability that I had met. So nowadays, you know, they're very, very common, those of us who have disabilities, to be out and around. But in those days, they were uh, basically um, out of sight of, of vision. Um, so I, we started off working on that. And then we created a communication system um, and went from there. Anybody who's interested in all of this, one of the things that we did was to try to gather up all of the information of what was available. And we created a series of resource books. And it basically, uh, they were about uh, an inch thick. And there were like three aids per page. So you can figure out how many there were at the time. Um, started off a little thinner, but they quickly grew to that size. So anybody who's interested in the real history, you want to see exactly which aids were available on which years all the way through. We, we did that all the way up until 1997. We put it all on CD um, after uh, personal computers became uh, popular. Uh, and then we did CDs and print up to 1997, at which time the world had sort of gotten onto the internet. And so we put it all on the internet um, as part of ABLE data and, and went from there. But the interesting thing is to watch the evolution. <clears throat> and it started off as being um, uh, first, you know, communication aids and things like this. Then it was special aids for special people. So all the early computer work was of the of the style where you would take a, 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 an Apple IIe or an Atari or something, and you'd make it into a typewriter that could be used by somebody who is blind, or you made it into um, a, a communication aid for someone who couldn't talk. Um, and it wasn't until, oh, a couple of years after that, that we began looking at how do we actually give access to the computer 
for the person with a disability. In other words, if everybody's going to be using them, then it's important for people with disabilities to be able to use them as well. And so uh, we began working on something called transparent access, and uh, that slowly evolved. Um, there was a famous meeting at the White House in 1985, where we had we gathered the big uh, computer companies um, and came in and introduced to them the fact that people with disabilities were using their computers, which many of them didn't know, uh, and that uh, we needed to get access. And that began sort of the process of looking at built-in access uh, to computers. The first accessibility features built into a computer were by Apple in 1987. Um, <clears throat> um, actually, a little before that, we got it into the 2E and then the 2GS and then the Macintoshes. Uh, of course, the only ones to survive today are the Macintosh or the 2Es and uh, the Macintoshes, right? We also had uh, Microsoft. Um, we had a set of accessibility features that Microsoft distributed on its uh, um, uh, supplemental driver disks. And so there was the ability to get a bunch of access features there. They got built in in 1995 and, um, and just things have just always progressed from there with more and more things being built in to all of the different operating systems. I wanna talk about a number of things as we go forward now as to how things are changing. I also want to talk about some of the challenges. We've come a long way from in the beginning um, where things actually had to be hacked. Uh, screen readers literally had to go in and reverse engineer the operating systems and figure out where to get information. And every time the operating system was updated, of course, it broke the screen readers and they had to start all over again. It was a real battle until finally they started creating APIs to attach things. Um, Nowadays, we're seeing more and more things being built in, which is nice because it's there, but it's limited in that if you happen to fit that particular AT or the kind of AT that's in there, it's great, it's there, it's free. But if it doesn't, a lot of the systems now are, are locked, so you can't actually do anything with them. So I wanna talk about some of the things that we've discovered in the last five, 10 years, some of the challenges that we've been working at, some of the solutions, and then go into the future a little bit and try and see where things are going and uh, what possible new barriers and new opportunities we may have. And I'll have some challenges for you at the end. Okay, so um, the title is because everyone needs to be able to use technology. And I don't mean some technology. I mean, everybody needs to be able to use all technology, the same technology, um, having saying, well, Right now, for example, if you need a screen reader or an assistive technology and you go into a library, all your friends, your colleagues, your siblings can use any computer in any room in the library and any program in the training program downstairs. But you can't because maybe your library has some AT. It'll be on one or two computers up in some room upstairs. Um, and uh, it won't be set up for you. Uh, it might not be your AT. And, a lot of libraries don't have it at all. Um, no AT at all on any of their computers. And so, you know, we need to have it so that when kids need to do homework and they can't do it at home, that they can go and use the computers everybody else can. Computers, um, television sets, information systems, kiosks, all of the, just think of going through a, a week without being able to access any digital interface. You can't even use your microwave. I mean, you, you literally can't live independently anymore today. So this is a challenge that we have. Not that they, we have some way for some people, usually bright individuals. For example, we have a lot of screen readers and screen reader users, and they're just amazing on the computer, but not every one of us is bright and technically oriented. And uh, if you get blind, there's no exception. You get the same spectrum of abilities. And there's an awful lot of blind people who can't use screen readers because they're just too complicated. So when we think we've solved the problem, we haven't solved it at all for some people. And we need to be looking at that too. So um, when we're looking at this, um, we also think of uh, disability as being something that happens for a small number of us 
um, and maybe some old people. But what you really need to do is just think about how old you want to live. So um, if you want to be 44, you want to be 54, you want to be 64, you want to be 74, you want to live past 74. And by the way, it just keeps going up. The longer you live, the more of us are going to have disabilities. Um, I always do this little exercise, especially with young folk. And I tell them, just look at this chart and pick one of those people. And that's going to be you. The people who are red have disabilities. And so just pick one of them and just stare at it as we go forward. And um, I usually have people stand and then they sit down if they uh, acquire a disability. And um, then when we get to this point, we took to all the people are standing up and say, okay, you people are still standing. You now have to take care of all of the rest of us because you've designed a world that we can't live in independently. And um, so we've all acquired disability. So you have to take care of the rest of us. And so we need to be thinking about that, especially it's a problem when you look at the graying of America and we're talking about a third of the population um, having disabilities as we get older. But there's something else. <clears throat> we are actually creating a new disability and I call it low digital affinity. <laughs> now, when I grew up, um, if I couldn't use technology, it was fine. There were lots of jobs, lots of things to do. You could live just fine without having to know how to deal with technology in any, any uh, major way. Um, but um, as we've gotten older, We've gotten more and more technology incorporated more and more into our, our lives. Um, and so we find that some people just have trouble using technology. Now, this isn't related to, to IQ. I used to call it TQ, but people kept equating it with technology quotient with IQ. Um, so we call it digital affinity. Um, and, and I know this because I know people that are blazingly brighter than I am. Uh, who can't use their technology. Uh, when the uh, pandemic came along, we had a real problem with professors at the top of their field who couldn't get on Zoom calls reliably. Um, they could use their computer for a few things that they had used it for. It was almost superstitiously using it. If, if it didn't work or didn't work exactly, they had no idea what to do. If they had to do something, no, they didn't know how to do it. So um, now I can use their technology and that doesn't make me brighter than them. Um, and it's not digital illiteracy either, because these are people who've been using these computers for decades. Um, they just aren't good at it. It's kind of like digital literacy is a skill. You can develop it, but digital affinity is a talent. And um, just like other talents, like singing or athletics or artists, the uh, some people are just really great at them. Some people can sing. Some people are tone deaf and they just plain, um, it doesn't matter how much they practice or study, they're just not going to be able to sing well or they're awkward and they're just never going to be a great athlete and no matter how much. So you can learn about digital, but if you don't have an affinity for it, it's just like, you know, practicing something that you're just not really going to be good at. And the problem is, is some of us um, and everybody on the call it's probably in the in the top five, 10 percent in terms of digital skills, digital, digital affinity. And so it's hard for us to recognize how hard it is, except we see it. You know, we see people where we explain something and and we just can't understand why it's so hard for them to understand it and and remember it. Well, I don't want to talk about half of the people or a third of the people or a quarter of the people. I'm just going to talk about the bottom five percent. OK, now. The bottom 5% who just really have trouble with technology for whatever reason. Um, these are people that um, uh, we go into a, a place and there's 20 computers lined up. And somebody standing behind somebody using a computer, there's only five of them being used. They're all literally identical down to, to every little uh, poster or pixel or I'm sorry, uh, uh, pinup or things alongside the, the computers. And he stands there for 20 minutes. And then he finally leaves, comes back at a couple hours, sits down to use the computer. And so we went up and said, you know, why did you want to use this computer? And he says, well, I know how to use this one. And you say, well, it's, it's identical to all the other ones. And he said, I don't know about that. All I know is that yesterday they came in and showed me this. And I know I can use this one, but I, I don't know if I can use those. We have people who come into the library 
who plug in a USB and then go look for a librarian. A librarian comes over, what's the problem? Well, my, my resume is on uh, this, uh, this thing here and, and I don't know how to find it. And if you think about it, it's, you know, we don't think about it, that's the problem. But if you think about it, it's complicated. First of all, you have to know that it's something called a file explorer and then you have to look for the, search for the file explorer and you have to know how to search for the file explorer. Then that opens up a window and then you have to know that you have to go down to uh, my PC uh, and then you've got to go down and then the the thing you stuck in is going to look like just like a whole bunch of other things and you look at it and it says tom's trucking on it none of them say tom's trucking on it uh, maybe it says sandisk maybe it doesn't say anything at all um, and yet this is what we do and we expect that that people are going to be able to deal with these technologies we've had schools where kids were flunking out of english class because they couldn't master the um computers that were being used in the classroom. Um, and we have had teachers who, who in a whole classroom full of computers tell the kids to turn all the computers off after about the third class of not being able to get anything taught because they're too busy running around trying to work with each student to get them to get to the right place. And they handed out paper and pencil and, 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 and highlighters and had them do all of the work on the highlighters and red pen. And then it had to be turned in digitally so they would go over and scan it in. And the number of people that we've heard who won't use a computer because they're afraid they will break it. Um, you show them an accessibility feature and, um, and they don't use it and you ask them why. And they just said, well, it's in the control panels and, and I, I just, I don't go in there. I was told not to go in there or I wouldn't dare go in there. And, and it turned out that going into the control panels to them was the same as if I told you, well, to make your car work better for you, you should go under the hood of your car and I'll tell you what things you should, you know, change around. And uh, no, better yet, you should go under the hood of your company's car. Remember, these are the computers at the library or the school um, and change these settings under the hood of the car uh, and, uh, and it'll run better for you. And so kids, adults who need uh, assistive technology they can't see aren't using them because they don't know where they are, they don't know that they exist, because they're too hard to find, or because they're just plain afraid to actually go in and look for them. So uh, to, to look at this, um, we looked at something that we called Morphic, which is an open source tool, it runs on the Windows and Mac, and I'll show it to you here uh, on, the, uh, on Windows. Um, and it does a couple things, but one of them is, it just brings a number of the features that are built right into the operating system out and puts them on a little bar. There's a little uh, icon down here in the bottom that you can click on to get to show or hide. Uh, and if the screen is just too small for you, you come in. Uh, we actually have had kids at the community uh, college who said, well, I don't like to wear glasses. And as a result, sometimes I forget them at home and then I can't I have trouble in school. Other people just have low vision and you can just click on text size now this is actually screen scaling, but we call it text size because that if I wrote screen scaling down here, nobody know what that would be and probably be afraid to click on it. And it doesn't just make what's inside of a window, you know, you can always do the plus sign and make the browser get larger and smaller, but that doesn't help you read any of the rest of the text on the screen, whereas screen scaling makes the entire screen larger. Um, we also put out the magnifier, so you can click and you have a magnifier that you can use. And of course, the, the highlighting uh, works. I mean, the mouse works even with the, the highlighting turned on. So if you have trouble, um, you can always do that. Um, we have screen snip, and this has nothing to do with disability. It's just a very convenient feature for being able to take a picture of any part. The kids use this for everything from uh, clipping pictures of code to send to their professor to ask for help to pick pictures off the internet and other documents to for emails or for reports they're writing. Um, but the uh, SNP tool is very cleverly uh, put underneath the notifications. Um, and so people have trouble seeing it. Some people don't even know it exists. One of the most popular things that we found uh, is uh, read selected. So people who have trouble reading for any, per, any reason, uh, it could be because they have low vision, it could be because they have uh, dyslexia, it could be because of 
um, any other uh, reading disability they have, or because they're just a really long time, they've got headaches, they've got a whole page that's reading and it's too hard to do. They can select any text. And the most common cause of color blindness is an inherited problem or variation. And have it read aloud to them. Now, for people with dyslexia, this is important because um, it's like um, trying to go to school without your glasses or without your contacts. Um, it just really, you know, you can lean over and squint at the screen and sort of see it, but it's really hard to learn if you're spending all of your time trying to figure out what it is you're looking at. And if you have dyslexia, it's even worse because when you write, see, when you're reading it and the letters are jumping around on you, that's hard enough. But when you write something, now you're supposed to proofread what you wrote to make sure that you did it right. And you can't because you can't rely on what you're looking at. But highlighting it, having read back to you, you can pick out your errors very quickly. And kids who can't have confidence in what they write, stop writing, bad, bad precedent. You get a bad loop going back around again. So the... Um, so we have the read selected. We also have contrast, which originally we had in here just for people who had low vision and wanted things in high contrast. You can set the contrast the way you like. For example, you can make it be yellow letters on a black background or whatever you like. Um, and two things that we discovered we didn't expect. One is that some individuals who have trouble reading have, it's easier to read if they have low contrast. And some even wanted to have black letters on a brown background, which to me is almost unreadable, but that's what really worked well for them. Don't know why, but that seemed to be an effect. Maybe it, it was less visual stimulation or something. Um, we also had kids who would have migraines and they would say that this was so much better. There's a dark mode, but when they kick on dark mode, what they find is that some things turn dark and some things don't. Whereas with the contrast, um, the whole screen would go dark. And so that was uh, better for them. Uh, another feature is uh, color filters. There's actually, if you have color blindness, you can click this and it shifts the colors to make things that are the same. Uh, they're different colors for people with uh, typical vision. Uh, but if you have a color anomaly, you see different, uh, then you may have charts that are color coded, but the two colors are the same color. Well, you can actually uh, have it so that you can change it to different ones and you can read, right click on any of these things, go to settings. And here you can see that as I change the different kinds of, of color blindness, you can see that it shifts all the colors in different ways. Uh, the goal is you want all the colors to be a different color uh, over here. And um, so this allows you to, to adjust it. And then once you have it adjusted, then you can just use this to turn it on and off in, in whatever mode you, you have. Um, and then there's dark mode, light, night mode. Um, there's also other number of other features like uh, pointer size, where um, you ever, if you ever have trouble losing your pointer, you can just come in here and you can easily adjust the size of the pointer to be larger or smaller. Um, professors like this, uh, students like the professors to know this because they're always using the computer and pointing around with their mouse and they can't see where on earth the professor's pointing. So making a larger pointer, uh, as a matter of fact, that and this, the other one they do is they want the professor to do is to blow the screen size up so that they can actually see what's on the screen. Uh, and then of course, when the professor goes back to their room, they don't wanna have it blown up. They can easily uh, go back to what it is they want or they can, for our young eagle-eyed friends, uh, students that uh, you can make it so you can have a lot of uh, screen real estate by actually making the screen smaller. Now, all of the features that I showed here, except the read selected, are all just built right into the operating system. Uh, and yet when we show this to people, they are just stunned that they have this information. We have people that are in charge of computer assistance. We have people that actually are disability services at universities and places and didn't have any idea that all of these things were built in and more in the operating system. Um, and as I said before, um, using this is not threatening. As a matter of fact, we put SNP and dark mode and night mode on here because some kids, um, you can remember back when you were in high school and your social life actually was as important or maybe more important for some kids than their academics. 
Um, and so if they were struggling, they would rather have people think that they were slow or stupid or lazy than to think they had a disability. So if you'd put a, something up with a big disability sign, it wouldn't work. But having something that looks like a utility bar that everybody else would be using as well. Um, so hence the SNP and the other kinds of things. Um, and, and all of these things are things that, that uh, well, most of the things on here are things that we would find useful ourselves at one time or another. Puts it out there as something that that's just an adjustment that they make. Um, we did a, a study and so we put a counter to see how often these features were used on computers. Uh, we put these on some computers, uh, sound about um, on uh, um, 7,000, 10,000 computers. Uh, uh, all the computers that um, Maryland, Michigan, Illinois, Wisconsin, and other ones are adopting them. And the features have been used over a quarter million times uh, by different people in these different places. Uh, so we put a counter on, we just let it run for, for four weeks uh, on a computer and there was zero use. There was the, the SNP tool, you'd see that used um, and that was it. None of the other features that are in the computers were used, uh, whereas uh, for the same computers in the same kind of environment in the same period of time, um, you'd have you know hundreds of uses, um, kinds of things of, of features and things. So this is the, um, the, the advantage of bringing things out and making them obvious, making them non-intimidating and making them feel like it's just part of, of um, usability. What I really like to do is to think of uh, accessibility as just extended usability. And if you think about digital affinity, it, it fits, you know, it's, it's not like there's a bright line. There's just a, a, a continual. And um, uh, when you talk to older people, of course, nobody who's old has low vision. They just have old eyes. Um, and, um, the, and they're not, you know, hard of hearing. It's just that everybody mumbles. Um, and so if we can figure out how to just make it so that you can just turn the volume up, you yeah, know, not a problem. And that's what we try to try do with, with these kinds of, of, of things. Now, a second thing this does is it allows you to save your settings. So you can set up a computer, including all your assistive technologies if you have, and then you can come up and you can tell it to save the setup. And then you can go to another computer and sit down to that computer and um, sign in and it'll set that computer up like the other one. But something that just came out is something that we called ATOD, Assistive Technology On Demand. And this goes one step further. With this, if you have a screen reader or you need reading software or you need uh, any type of assistive technology, um, you can um, set up a computer or even if you don't have a computer at home, and this is one of the advantages for kids who don't have a computer at all and they need AT, they're kind of out of luck normally because um, you could give them AT and, and a lot of programs will give kids AT, but they won't give them a computer. The rule is we will buy you an assistive technology, but we won't buy anything for you that somebody else in the family could use because too often that's in fact what happens is, is it disappears. Somebody else in the family uses it or, or whatever. Uh, and so the um, kid who needs AT and it doesn't have a computer at home or doesn't have their own computer is basically out of luck. But with AT on demand, you could sit down to any computer at the library, any computer at the school, in the labs, in the classrooms, and you sit down and your AT shows up on that computer, installed, configured just the way you need it to be. And then when you get up, it disappears again. So it's kind of like when we have our glasses, you know, we sit down to a computer, we can take out our glasses and use it on any computer. Same with them. They can sit down to any computer and be able to use it. And so this is the first time that kids have actually been, who didn't have their own computer can actually use AT. Uh, but even the kids who have their own computer, often we are required to use computers at school. And so this ability to have the AT show up on the computer is like a complete game changer in terms of, uh, of accessibility uh, for products. And both Morphic, which I just showed you, and the ATOD are both open source and free 
um, capabilities that uh, Raising the Floor uh, U.S., it's a nonprofit organization, uh, is making available. The goal is to basically get them on, on every computer, uh, every public or shared uh, computer. So that's uh, the, the Morphic. And the, um, as I said, we started off with just auto personalization, that is the ability to move the settings, but we quickly discovered that a lot of people just were not able to use the computers and they didn't even know about the built-in features. We had to figure out how to make accessibility simpler. And so we shifted our focus from just accessibility to try to make it easier to use for, for, for everybody. Uh, and so you saw the, the, uh, the version we had. Um, we also have the ability to save more than one setup so that uh, some people in the morning have more abilities than they do at the end of the day. And so they can actually set it up. Some kids, um, when they're doing their homework by themselves, they want full board, all the AT out there, all set up. But when they're with their friends, it's kind of like, um, you know, you wear your glasses when you're studying, but if you're out studying with your friends, you don't want to wear your glasses. So you try and make do without. So you can actually have different setups that have different AT. Or um, as for this individual, um, her abilities would change from the morning to the night. And so she can just uh, select a different setup and it'll set the computer up uh, differently to match her abilities. Or uh, this is a, a guy who um, has to always use loner computers. Um, and the trouble is he needs AT, but now he gets a loner, he logs in, it's all set up for him. When he's done, turns it in, it all disappears. Um, if you go to the library, so the first time uh, people can sit down to any computer at the library and be able to use it. Um, so what are some of the observations uh, from just this much? Um, well, first of all, there are many who can use computers, um, but they're only able to use them partially or superstitiously. Um, we need to, and not just with AT, we need to make them simpler. We used to have an iPad that um, you'd get it and there were icons. You could have just a small number of programs on the screen. You touch them, you go into the program. If you want to get out of it or you got confused or you got lost, you could just push that button at the bottom and it dropped you back out. Really simple. But we just can't leave well enough alone. And we can't even leave it that you can turn that mode back on again. Now, if you pick up an iPad, if you bump it wrong, all of a sudden you got two, it splits into two screens. How you got there, you don't know. You did something. Um, how do you get out of it? You don't know. There's no way to get out of it. When you get into an application and you want to get back out of it, it's, well, well, just swipe up. So you do. And what happens? The page scrolls up. And you say, no, no, swipe up from the bottom. So they swipe up from the bottom. Doesn't work. No, no, swipe up from just below the bottom of the screen. Now touch, now very carefully. Now don't lift your finger up. You have to slip up and you get out. Well, that's great if you got great motor control and you don't have any tremor and you haven't by now given up because you have your young whippersnapper who's telling you that, that you can do it. You just have to make the right sort of voodoo motions at it and then it'll do what you want, but you can't figure We. We have all of these gestures. We build in all this um, complexity. And it's okay as long as you could make it so that it could still operate the simple way, but we never do. We always just keep adding more and more. And so even the things that we made that were simple, we figure out how to make complicated. Now we have iPads that uh, as soon as the, uh, the old one dies, it had the button on it, the people can't figure out how to use them anymore. We need to think more about this. We need to think about the fact that a large portion of the population doesn't have our level of a digi digital affinity. They can't remember. Uh, remembering is a hard thing um, for them to do, to learn new things. And we keep changing things on them. Uh, and many people are just completely unable to use the stuff we're doing today. And yet that's the only way you can get information, make your doctor's appointment, get your feedback, uh, et cetera. So we need to be paying a lot more attention to these things. Um, and that's why I think low digital affinity itself uh, should be thought of as a disability. Not that it was originally, we've made it one. If everybody needed to be able to draw 
really well in order to get a job or to sing in order to get a job or to be athletic to be able to get a job, then there'd be a lot of us with very good paying jobs who would be unemployable. Uh, but we've made it so that everybody who can't use technology is going to have a problem. So let's look to the future now. Um, this, we've seen the past, we've seen the, the current, we're seeing new things coming out like AT on demand that we never could do before that are making it uh, so that it's more ubiquitous. Uh, but where are things going in the future? Um, we're going to be seeing VR and AR um, for both real-world augmentation and for abstract visualization, and even for, for creating new worlds, artificial worlds. Um, we don't have it yet, but someday we will have liquid hardware that, sh that changes shape. We have some crude things now that will automatically take shape, but um, in the future, we will have something that looks like a liquid crystal display, except it'll be tactile. And that's going to be really interesting. And we're starting to see those kinds of things happening now. Um, natural conversations to interact with ICT. Um, what we have now isn't quite natural. Um, and uh, you still find that um, there's, a, you probably are all aware, there's an entire new career called uh, prompt engineers. And they are people who make $200,000 a year. And all they do is they know how to ask an AI a question so that it'll actually give you the right answer instead of giving you something uh, off to the side. Um, and so having a natural conversation, we're not there yet. Um, someday we're going to get there. But natural for who? And this is a problem. Um, we have natural and abstract gestures, more and more things being done that way. Um, but again, natural to who? Uh, and a lot of people, they just don't get it. If there's not anything tactile that you're actually touching, uh, this arbitrary grabbing stuff like this, they just don't understand. We understand, we don't understand why they don't understand, but it's again, it's an extension of, of digital affinity. Uh, direct brain interfaces, we are going to see them. We're going to see them uh, sooner than, than we think. Um, and we're actually going to allow our kids to have them sooner than you think. You'd say, oh, I'm not going to do that. And and yeah, I think that's where we'll all be until the day when our kid comes home and says, you know, you know, dad, mom, can I have a, a, a you know, a, a brain implant? Because, you know, all the other kids are getting them now and I can't compete. And it's, like you don't want little kids to be getting too digital, but if it's part of where they're teaching and and uh, homework and it's an advantage and uh, they're going to be at a disadvantage without it, that's a problem. Again, we create a disability by changing the baseline, and then we have to make sure that everybody can can come up along with us. Um, and we're going to have a merging of external and internal artificial and augmenting and, and things that's going to extend and, and reinvent our ability to perceive, understand, remember. Uh, people who are autistic and who can't, Asperger's, who can't get the clue, they can't figure out when people are angry or mad or, or anything, um, we can have virtual sensing that would be telling them this and giving them clues. So some of these things will help. And other people, if some people have it and some people don't, then some people are going to know whenever anybody is is dissembling and when they're not. And and so, if we're not all having the same uh, um, enhancements, if you will, then suddenly they're going to be able to play us, and we can't play them. And it's an unlevel playing field. And I don't know where it all begins. I don't know where it all ends. Um, but I do know it's going to change, and I do know it's happening faster than we're figuring out how to do something about it. Um, and then we have the digital equity. What's coming, Who? what barriers are present, um, uh, what new opportunities are gonna be coming along and what can we and what should we be doing? Now, we just held a, a workshop. So Vince Cerf and I uh, co-hosted a workshop to look at the future of interface. Uh, and it had two parts. The first day, we just had top people in mainstream uh, computer vision, AI, um, a direct brain interface, et cetera, come in and uh, panels and, and talk about where things are and where they might be in 20 years. Uh, 
Uh, and then the next day we brought in all the accessibility experts um, and uh, had panels to go over and say, okay, what problems do we see? What advantages do we see? Um, and we also had a, a presentation, which I'll talk about in a minute, uh, which is um, the possibility of even looking at accessibility in a completely uh, different fashion. Now, if you didn't uh, make it or you missed the uh, presentation, uh, you can go to uh, the website um, and um, on the campus here, there's the Future of Interface uh, campus. Um, there's an auditorium and exploratorium and a forum. And if you go into the auditorium, um, you'll find all of the presentations. So here's all of the first day presentations and you can see the chairs and you can see who the panel members all were. And then here's the second day, which is all about the future of accessibility. You can also go into the exploratorium um, and in here you can find uh, like all about inputs so pointing devices. And so you can click on this and it gives you all the different, well, first of all, an annotated bibliography, but then just all the different types of pointing devices. Um, and uh, this is a continual growing resource. So if you're teaching and you want your um, students to be able to, to get um, a, a broad uh, spectrum of experience about different kinds of things, uh, you can look. And these go past and future. So you can go through and see the different um, types of things. Um, something that you will find fun is to click on the visions of the future. Uh, and here's past visions of the future. And so you can go all the way back to the 1950s, 1957, 1968. And these are all visions of the future, uh, except this one, which seems to be a parody on the other. It's actually put out by uh, British Telecom but it almost feels like it's making fun of, of other ones. This is a sensorama. This is supposed to be the first um, uh, virtual reality, if you will, Xerox star, knowledge navigator, uh, et cetera. Um, and then we also have some, uh, and by the way, if you are aware of any that are not in here, please let us know. You see this little feedback form, any place in the site that you see anything that's wrong, or that's missing, or that you know something that should be there, shouldn't, you can just click on this, you can just, you know, highlight it, and then uh, just uh, click in, uh, uh, and, and, and then you can leave a note um, to uh, about it, okay? So you can um, discard this one away, um, and let us know, or you can send an email if you want to, however you want to do it. We have today's visions of the future, and then we also have movie versions of future interfaces, et cetera, that you can uh, that you can look at. Uh, we have a forum, and one of the things we're doing is that we are actually going to be uh, working on the development of um, uh, an R and D agenda, which you can see up here uh, that's coming. And the R and D agenda is going to be uh, twofold. One is what mainstream research should occur in order for us to be able to um, uh, build the types of AT that we would like to have. Um, and the other one would be what's the uh, disability research that we need to do in order to get there. For example, um, we'll be talking in a minute about uh, something that where every individual could have an interface that's just custom made for them. So if you have somebody who's blind and super bright and you have another person who's blind and who is uh, a severe intellectual disability, um, they're obviously gonna need different, dis different interfaces even though they're both blind. Um, but what should the interface look like for the individual who's blind and has a severe intellectual disability? And you'd say, well, it should be simpler. You can make some sort of common sort of comments. But we really don't know how to design things for specifically to be optimum for all sorts of classes of, of individuals. So that's where we need to be focusing a lot of disability research. Um, mainstream, there are things like machine vision and, and, and AI and things like this that um, we would like to have done under mainstream funding, um, but that we really need in order to create better um, interfaces and tools. Uh, and of course, the site is is accessible as well, so you can see how that how to how to do that. Um, in here is a, just the place, and there will be a tour and press room and stuff like this. Uh, if you want to contribute, you can come down here, click on contribute, and and see how to do that. All right. 
So, um, the, um, so I would like to talk a little bit here uh, at the end about rethinking accessibility for next next generation interfaces. Um, now, today's guidelines and accessibility, we have a lot of them. Um, the um, 86 or something, now they've added some more um, for web accessibility kinds of things. If you go to 508 and you look at all the different technologies, uh, it's even more, it's pages and pages and pages. Um, and we have companies that have whole teams of individuals, not only researchers, but people trying to do it. We have teams in, in the accessibility trying to make the web pages accessible. And um, with all of that work and being stuff putting in, um, we're still finding out that it's still failing. Um, we're talking about people doing surveys and finding that, you know, three to 10 percent of the home pages are accessible. And that's just the home pages, not the whole site. Um, we have products where there's a few, you know, like the, the iPhone, which is you know, amazing in the number of accessibility features that has into it. Um, Android, Windows have accessibility features built into them. Um, but two things. One is they have huge teams. Um, they don't cover all disabilities. Um, there are only some. And the vast majority of products don't. And, and a lot of the innovation in products are in smaller companies. They don't have any teams. And so with all of this focus we've been doing, they are now estimating that less than 5% of the products are accessible. And even the ones that are, are not accessible to more than 50% of the, of the people that need it. Um, the adaptive AT to make them accessible only works mostly on Windows and Mac OS. The other ones are locked down. Um, and none of these cover uh, all the different types, degrees, and combinations of disabilities. And there's very limited accessibility for people with cognitive language and learning disabilities. And it's only getting worse as we look at the emerging technologies. So um, if people are spending all this time and effort and we're barely scratching and it's actually asymptotic, I mean, it's it's not just like it's a curve and it's sort of growing up, it's more going asymptotic. Um, we need to be looking at something different. And so what if we used a different approach? Now we continue doing the old, we're not saying we stop doing that, but what if we used machine vision and AI to create something I call an infobot? Uh, and it can perceive, understand, and operate any digital interface on any product, at least as well as the median human. Now that doesn't mean this thing's as bright as the brightest person, but it's the sort of the median person. If we can make it, be as smart as the median person, half the population. If an entire half of the, the best, brightest, most able half could use it, then the Infobot could. Now, are we there yet? No, but we're getting there pretty quick, I think. Now we combine that with something I'll call an individual user interface generator. Now this is something that'll generate an interface to match a, a person, a single person's abilities for any product they encounter. So. The person who's got this, they aim it at the microwave and it gives them an interface that they can use. They aim it at the thermostat and they can see it. They can aim it at the television set. And for the first time, they can have an interface that makes sense to them. Um, not only that, but if they go to HBO and then they go to Disney and then they go to Prime and they all do basically the same thing and they all do it differently. So that even if you figure out how to do something on one, it doesn't apply on the others. If it's the same thing for all three, it would present, present it in a same or similar fashion to the individual um, who was looking at it. So, and then just when you figured out prime, what do they do? They change it, okay? And so just when somebody who's older finally figures out how to use something, it gets changed and now they're completely lost again. Um, so, you'd not only make it so that it would stay, same products would operate the same, but even when you went across different products, your mental model would be the same. And it would be the interface that all these products would have if everybody in the world looked like that person, okay? So if everybody in the world were blind and had this intelligence level, this is what the interfaces would look like. And they would all be designed like this. And that's the interface that they would see. The Infobot itself uh, would be open source. It would be cloud-based. Later, it could be local. 
um, and it would be free to use. So that's there. And the company, in order to make something accessible, doesn't have to try to make it accessible to every person with every type, degree, and combination of disability, which is kind of what we're being asked them to do today, which is actually impossible. Um, they would just have to make it so that it was understandable by the Infobot, or which would be essentially making it, if you can make a product that half the population can use, um, we make the Infobot that smart. Um, and if you don't want to test it, just see if the Infobot can use it and, and bingo, you're home free. And now anyone can access your product uh, and with an IUIG. Uh, for users, this would mean that there'd be near ubiquity of accessibility, that for the first time, they'd be able to access any interface because except for a company that creates an interface that less than half of the people can use. I know that there are those products out there. I've run into them. Um, but the, um, the ability to use computers can, products that nobody intended or never even thought about accessibility for uh, would be able to be uh, accessible to all of the different individuals. Uh, for developers, um, you don't need to train your people to be able to handle all types and degrees of combinations of disability, which you already can't. Um, there's no longer 80 plus guidelines and provisions that have to be followed. Meet the basic guidelines, um, do all the stuff that's easy to make your stuff directly accessible, and then make sure the Infobot can understand it, and then everybody would be able to use your product. Um, and then consumer advocates and experts, instead of spending all their time lobbying industry to try and make things accessible, uh, more accessible, accessible to everyone, which are all um, impossible kinds of things to do. And as soon as you get your team up, they roll over, they leave, they come back in, you promote them, you got to train new people. Um, the disability and consumer experts can spend their time trying to figure out, well, how would you make a product? that works for some of all of these populations that we don't now meet. Again, we create things for bright blind people, but how about individuals who are just average blind people and people who are struggle with technology and are blind and who are older and can't learn new things and became blind. Uh, if we learn how to make those things accessible, then we'd be able to do. And then manufacturers, experts like they do now can join in the effort um, and we can have the R&D sections of these companies instead of trying to figure out how to you know, stuff another feature into their, their product for someone can actually be looking at uh, some of the really hard kinds of things. Now, uh, limitations, uh, it's gonna be hard. Um, we, we haven't done it yet. It won't be 100%. Uh, Mona Lisa will not be perceivable by a blind person in a symphony. Um, will not be uh, fully accessible to somebody who's deaf. You know, we can do visual representations of it, but that's not the same. Quantum physics sites are still not gonna be accessible to somebody with a severe intellectual disability, um, uh, but we can uh, get it so that at least people can do all the stuff they need to be living independently. Um, and this will require a new contract between industry and consumers and society. So. Um, we have to think about all these social and the unintended consequences and stuff that would come with it. Um, so um, so digital affinity uh, is, I think, a new disability. I would like to make that point. Uh, low, low digital affinity is not a problem 40 years ago. It is one that we, it's a problem of our own creation. Um, the current approach to accessibility is not working well for many people. Uh, and it's not working well for even the people that works well for most products. Um, so a new approach is being discussed and uh, we need a lot more uh, exploration of it and we need a bunch of developments in order to make it happen. But something has to happen. We have to be able to figure out, we can't be just that, well, uh, you know, we're going to keep designing the world for, for those people who can use it and everybody else that's in trouble. So uh, thank you. Um, uh, I'm going to end with just this thing. Uh, if anybody here is interested in to helping to set this broad R&D agenda to address the above for mainstream and for disability, let me know. Uh, anybody who's interested in helping to maintain the future of interface website as a resource by uh, finding and, and getting other things in that we that, that, are, that are missed so far, it's a community process. Um, anybody who's interested in exploring the Infobot or IUIG concept. Um, uh, anybody who's interested in creating algorithms, we're now doing a new open source seizure prevention tool. 
for a kid, for kids or adults, anybody who has uh, flash induced seizures. Uh, we have an old analysis tool that we're making, uh, updating, making open source. But then we want to make a prosthetic one that that actually people can have that eventually we like to see built right into TVs, et cetera. Um, so that uh, just like you could turn the volume up and down, you could turn the sensitivity to flash up and down. And it, if some flash and content came along, it would uh, be able to ameliorate it. Um, and then helping to move Morphic and AT on demand uh, to your campus. Uh, we're also moving it out to rural and tribal schools and libraries and more. So anybody who's uh, interested in getting involved in any of these things, uh, let me know as well. Uh, thank you. Well, thank you very much, Greg. Um, and uh, this is the time when when all of us are uh, uh, interested in uh, hearing uh, more more specific answers. If you can if you can stand it, I mean the simple one that I will um, start with, and then everybody that wants to raise your hand or or uh, type a message, um, you know, anything where you can call uh, yourself to my attention, I'll try to uh, jump in and get get you on. Uh, but um, I want you to talk about uh, the the um, the value uh, of of uh, universal design. It was a, something that was touted. I've seen many aspects of it work. I understand you're going to talk about the limitations also. But but uh, I I I was you know especially delighted when I made a product where people uh, started using it because of its disabilities friendly. Um, uh, you know, aspects and, and people, you know, it, it, the, the flood of, of love that comes back when you make something accessible is something. And what I loved about what we did at IBM is often we made things as you were talking about, so that just the way they come out of the box, they happen to be accessible. And uh, that, and so anyway, you want to speak to that maybe? Yeah. Um, I said before that extended usability. Um, uh, when we, uh, when the pandemic came, we found that um, uh, three examples. One was a computer scientist, one wrote compilers, and one individual um, um, that was a, a physics professor. And none of the three of them could get onto um, a Zoom call. They had weekly Zoom calls with the family, uh, and somebody would have to call them up 15 minutes before the Zoom call on the phone and slowly walk them through getting onto the Zoom call. And they would do that every week for two years, okay? And you'd think, well, oh, they'll figure it out after a while. And they, they couldn't. Um, it was just beyond them to figure that out. Um, I had two colleagues um, who are both engineers who came to me the other day and uh, they want to know all about this. One of the other things you can do is morphic you can make custom morphic bars where it just has all the functions you want and you just click on them. That's also free and you can get that from, from uh, just go to morphic.org by the way is where you go to find out about that. Um, and the, um, uh, and they were said they wanted, they wanted to know all about it because they were finding that they were, slowly losing their ability to use their computer and they wanted to have something that was really paint by number you know push this button for email push this button for this push this button to do that push this button to get on a zoom call and the buttons are there and they never go away and so i never have to understand how to hire navigate the hierarchy of my computer and stuff like this um because they could see that what was coming um if we think of it as extended usability then it's not universal design. It's just you're just keeping everybody in mind, if you will, when you design. Now, you're not going to make your product so that somebody who's deaf blind can use your product usually because it's going to need a Braille display and you can't have a Braille display on your thermostat. Um, the And putting Braille on the buttons doesn't help because pushing the buttons isn't the problem. It's what's being displayed that's the problem. The uh, So making it, as accessible as you can and that your team can and that you know how to uh, is, is great. And what you find is that whenever we do that, the error rate for everybody else goes down, their productivity goes up. Um, so it's just plain 
stupid to not do it because um, we, the problem is that we all design this stuff and, and it's all real easy for us. And so we just assume it's easy for everybody else. And what it plays out as is everybody else is just slower than they need to be because it's not as easy. It's as if we made everything real. We were all big football players. We made everything heavy. You could still make dinner, but you have to go a lot slower because you're hauling everything around and everything weighs really heavy. And it's really hard to pour a little sugar out because it's in a great big 50 pound sugar bag uh, kind of thing. So that's what we just need to remember. Yeah. Um, and and yet, I mean, the, the you know, people that were blind, like the track point, better people that, that have no limbs, like uh, the- yeah, yeah. people who are blind, like the track point, except that people who are blind can't the track point is a pointing device and so they could use it for something else but the track point by itself didn't mean that they could use the computer and uh, having part of the computer accessible but not the whole computer accessible also is not helpful it's like you can get into the front room but you can't get into the rest of the house but but it, well, we have a really accessible front room um the we need to think about the whole thing and and think about all of the people the fact that we made something accessible to this group, Apple, you know, they put some accessibility in and they got all this huge praise for, for the for the blindness access parts. Um, but there's still, I get calls all the time still from people who are blind who can't use any of the accessibility features in the iPhone who are blind because it's really got, it, it was wonderful for all the bright blind people who could use it, but it didn't help all the other blind people who can't use it because it's too complicated. And that's what I'm talking about. It's it's great to build accessibility in that can go as far as it can. And they got so much uh, good feedback that they keep putting more and more and more accessibility features in, but it still doesn't help all the people that can't use it, even with those features in. And that's the, the two parts. One is always be trying to think about who can't use it, um, You know, pat ourselves in the back for the people who can, um, but always be thinking about, yeah, but how about the people who can't? how bad is it for them to not be able to use this? And, and that's a real problem. Right. There's a lot more to be said. Please let somebody else, uh, it's time no for somebody to, to, to chime in. Uh, I don't see hands up, but uh, just chime in if you can. Nancy, I'm sure you have a question or two. Oh, I was just uh, responding to the folks who said, can we get a list of the URLs? And so oh, I was yeah. compiling that list. Okay. Yes. Uh, uh, let me uh, in the chat. I can just do that quickly here, um, if I can find the. Here, Greg. I, let me start, and then you can put in the ones that you didn't include. Okay, and these aren't in the the same order as you had um, and, mentioned. And, and Greg is quite findable on the web. Um, Trace uh, and and his work is 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 not hard to find. So so it's not yeah, somebody, a lot. And I'm giving out your. There's my email address. Your email. Did you do it already? Yep. Um, okay. John, you seem to be un unmuted. Are you hoping to say something? Well, yeah. I was just going to follow up on um, on Greg's comment about uh, iPhones and how they turned out to be hard to use. I stopped. I've owned seven Macs in my life. I've stopped using Macs because I do everything with my feet. Um, I rarely touch a keyboard or a mouse. Um, I control the. I do all the clicking and mousing with my feet. And um, uh, Max, last time I used one, which is about uh, five or eight years ago, uh, was utterly dependent on you doing everything with your hands. And as long as you did everything with your hands, you were in good shape. And um, if you didn't, uh, like me, uh, you're just kind of screwed. Has that changed? Um, yeah, there's a lot more keyboard accessibility uh, on the Mac than there used to be. Uh, and they have actually, you can do it with a single switch now where you can drive things around and stuff. Um, so, and I guess then you can get assistive technologies uh, to, 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 to take that even further. Um, Windows uh, was keyboard and in the beginning, Windows ran without a mouse. So um, you could do all the Windows stuff from the keyboard. So uh, Windows is uh, generally more keyboard accessible um, in its nature. Uh, the Mac was trying to introduce the mouse. And so it actually forced you to use the mouse for some things. It was impossible to do some things. Um, that's why one of the first features I got built into the 
uh, the Mac was mouse keys, where you could use the keyboard to control your mouse. Um, so you can drive the mouse entirely around uh, and operate the whole computer. Uh, funny story, um, uh, sticky keys was one of the other first features that I got built in. And um, the sticky keys is the one that you, allows you to hit a key and then another key. So every key becomes sticky so that you can type a, um, an at sign by hitting the the, the shift and then the two. Two, two, two key, yeah. Um, and um, and it, it, it was in there about two months, I think it was, after they released it. And I got a call and it was Chris Espinosa, who was VP of software. And um, he said, hi, Greg. He said, this is Chris Espinosa. Uh, I'm VP of software. And I said, yeah, Chris, I know who you are. And he said, um, uh, you, you know, we had that feature so you could use the computer with one hand. He said, well, how do you turn that on? And I said, oh, it's it's really easy. Just in the instruction book, it's even easy to find because you printed the accessibility feature section of the instruction book in large print. And he says, this is software engineering. He said, we don't have any instruction books. And so I said, oh, okay, well, just, you know, tap on the shift key five times and you see the little icon show up there. Yeah, well, then you're all set. And then I said, um, oh, by the way, uh, why did you ask? Um, and he said, well, I was in, in Paris last week and um, I slipped and I fell and I shattered my elbow and um, I can't use one arm and I can't get any work done. Um, <laughs> so here's a little uh, karma that the two months after we got the accessibility feature built in, the head of uh, OS uh, or software engineering actually um, uh, needed it uh, himself. So um, that's another reason to think about it is is that we all from time to time uh, may be trying to do something or you have a, a child in one arm uh, or worse yet, um, you wanna make stuff that's so that it's so easy to use that you can use it uh, with limited abilities and li limited cognitive skills. Cause the first time your kid falls and cracks his head and, and, it's, and it's blood pouring down their face and you're trying to use your computer to, to call or find out something or whatever, um, you will find out that you are essentially brain dead um because you cannot you do not think you do not anything you're just trying to focus on on getting something done so making things that work with a fighting screaming kid wrestling trying to get out of your hand you've got no stability uh you not thinking very well and you still want to be able to use things so this is um this is the world we want to design for i see a couple other people that have um, their mutes off, Michael Wirth and Randy Bruling. I, are you guys interested? And Suzanne in had a good question also in the in the chat. Yeah. So let's sure, put sure. her in so the go, queue. Okay, she'll go next if these people aren't going to speak. Um, either of you going to speak, or is it time for Suzanne's question? Maybe. I'm confused. Um, thanks, That's great, Suzanne. thanks, Thanks, you guys. <laughs> no, I find it super inspiring, and I'm just. You know, I've got a lot of ideas uh, zinging based on um, the um, expert description of these issues. And so I was wondering if, um, you know, when is embodied interaction coming and um, when can we pair uh, with things uh, to use more of our bodies and our minds uh, with these systems? It'll be very interesting to see how that um, comes together with AI. And I just thought, wondered if there was a perspective on that. Uh, you said uh, when, what is coming? Embodied. Uh, embodied interactions okay. and AI. Yeah, yeah. yeah, that's it. And even, you know, there's individual interaction, right? Then there's group interaction with flocking and swarming and all that good stuff, right? In surgical environments and decision-making. I just think it's a super interesting area. Yeah, uh, uh... One of the places to watch is going to be uh, Apple with its new um, VR, AR. Um, because if you notice, it, where a lot of people you have uh, controllers you hold in your hand and you're sort of squeezing buttons to try and simulate fingers grabbing, um, what they seem to be doing more is to try to just really use your real body. So when you want to make something, you reach out and you grab the corner of it and you pull it out, you know, and you, you, you actually use your hands in ways that seem to be more natural to the way we do stuff. I remember the first time I was using a uh, VR handset, um, I, I, it, it was hard for me to do things because I was so much of my um, cognition was spent 
trying to figure out how I'm supposed to push which button to make it be what, you know, it didn't, it didn't behave the way the world I knew behaved. Now, it doesn't mean in the long run that once you learn how to do that, that you wouldn't be faster with a button instead of a, a natural one. Don't know. Um, the uh, But uh, there's always that, that uh, you know, learning curve getting on. Um, and then, of course, there will be some people have uh, machine sense. Um, so I discovered that that I have a, a kind of, I guess, machine sense. Um, the first time I got into a, a sailboat, uh, I passed my lightweight weather rating. And then every time I went out to go sailing, it was heavy weather. So the second time I got into a boat, I just decided to take the heavy weather rating test um, and barely passed. Um, but it's because the boat just sort of made sense to me. And, and for other people, it didn't make sense, you know, what you were supposed to do to make it uh, behave the way it's. And so if somebody doesn't have machine sense, yes. then what works really efficiently for us, because maybe we have it, um, you know, which is not going to work for them. Yeah, so, no, I love that, like becoming one with the interaction. Yeah. And so what is natural for some people, instrumented uh, interactions will be something they'll pick up and and they'll just merge with the machine and they don't even think about it they'll push the buttons or twist the knobs and and they can do it and you watch some of the kids on the game controllers and it's just you know it's they don't think about anything they just they just know what they want it to do and their hands automatically do it um other people that even after they do it for a long time they're still pushing buttons to make things happen of course that's going to be a different performance and that's <laughs> Cognitive overload with pushing bu buttons. It does take thought process to do it. It's not as natural. Right. Uh, but for some people, it becomes natural very quickly. And that's the difference. Um, uh, and it's like some athletes, the same thing. You know, there's some people, athletes that'll cross train, they'll go uh, learn a whole new sport and be good at it. And it just isn't fair, you know, that they can go into a sport that we've been playing yeah. for some amount of time and they just walk onto the field. They never played it before. And and in five minutes, they're playing it better than we do. And it's, oh, you know, yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. It brings up uh, flow too, right? Chitsimahalyu and flow and, and that um, synthesis, mimesis, whatever it is. Yeah. Thank you so much. Yeah. And so I think it's going to be amazing what we end up doing. Some of us end up doing with these virtual environments where we will merge into them and then we will begin behaving and functioning in ways that are just completely unreal to the way we do now like you said flocking and stuff and and to think of having a meeting by having everybody flock and, and look at it from a different view and floating around and other people you know if they, they're not sitting with two feet on the ground um you know they they just freak out um you know the vertigo or whatever they would just have uh, trouble using it so um we need to remember that whatever we design um can't be it can be optimized to work with people who are optimal but it's also got to be functional as functional as possibly can uh for people who are different than us that have different skills that's great um greg i uh this is a, a really important topic and i love uh, all the passion you bring to it and uh, and I think a lot of people are going to get a lot of fun out of uh, going to that that beautiful virtual environment that you've created. Um, maybe there's uh, another one more question or two, and then maybe we'll uh, we'll call it an evening. Michael or Randy, do you have comments? As Michael, you've been you've been uh, typing some of them. I don't know if Greg has been keeping up. No, I haven't been watching the the comments. I've been, uh, uh, but I know right, Michael. So that's you unmuted, Michael. So why don't you uh, read out one of your questions? Thoughts. I'll stress. People are shy, you know. Um, but Nancy often isn't. Do you have a <laughs> Nancy's thought about disabilities research for for decades as well? Right. Uh, well, I I was involved in earlier versions of what now has become morphic, and I used to I used to work for Greg via another organization. And so I tested a lot of that stuff and it's wonderful to see what kind of made the final cut and, uh, you know, features that you guys found the most uh, compelling, 
for your audience. And it's great that you've got the cooperation of the libraries and the community colleges and schools and so on, because that really does force everybody to uh, take the mission seriously and have a, a sense of real people who they're building for. So, so that's not a question. Um, in my in yeah in my uh, experience with uh, product design, I have found a time and again that every effort I put in to designing it for disabilities improvements um, really helps products uh, succeed and be well well respected and appreciated. Um, and also, I've been involved with situations where people were quite clear that something wasn't accessible and the instructions were as much a problem as the affordances built into the thing. And I'm thinking right now about a situation where in Oakland, no one was able to vote with disabilities. And when the instructions were changed, suddenly there were no more people complaining about not being able to, to vote with disabilities and many were. So there, there's that side too. And I, you, you brought up a little bit of that story with Ep Spinoza, but I think um, for all of us uh, making UX, you know, you can, sometimes things are natural and sometimes we have to learn about them. Yep, yep. And um, the, uh, the only other thing I would say is if you fail a lot in trying to make things accessible, that means you're, you're winning because you're learning. Uh, Nancy's best contribution was when she would come back with all of the people who couldn't use it and all the people who failed uh, and, and how they failed. And, and sometimes uh, she would be able to suggest how to uh, address that. And sometimes it would be like, I don't know how we're going to fix it, but let me, let me tell you all the things that are wrong. Um, the, uh, you, you only learn uh, through finding people that your product won't work with. And if everybody you uh, try your product with can use it, you're testing it with the wrong people. Yeah. So, <laughs> yeah. So I I, I want to just um, uh, end by saying that uh, uh, this is a fabulous thing, and I want to uh, appreciate uh, Greg again because he came in uh, when others weren't able to, and and he, you I've been wanting to have you speak here for for some time, so I'm really excited about. You taking the time and really appreciate it. It's uh, I know it's a little late for many of you, and I'm sorry about that. Um, and um, next month, uh, this we'll, we'll have another fabulous talk, I'm sure. So uh, thank you all for joining, and I think that um, ends our our uh, evening together. Thank you. Thanks. Okay. Bye bye everybody. Bye bye. <laughs>